Welcome to another edition of Emancipated Human. I have a very, very cool guest with me today, Kendall Williams. I've been following her for maybe a year and a half, perhaps uh, a little longer, and she has a lot of uh, practical things that we can learn from her. Uh, she is a, an educator. She empowers people by teaching them about sexuality. And I think that one of the really important things about freedom, about liberty, is to be able to express her sexuality and express ourselves through our sexuality. Uh, she has a thing that she says, uh, good things come to those who sex. And actually, she has a meme on it on Facebook, and I'll, I'll pass it around again. It's really, really uh, an important subject. So um, on that, we have a lot of... Um, myths and uh, taboos around sex, but you and I were talking just a minute, a minute ago about um, the life force of people, and you were telling me about um, how their um, sexual energy, you can tell by just looking at them. Can you explain just a little bit about that? It's really just about the empowerment that we have, and I'm not talking about empowerment at work, because there's lots of go-getters, successful you know, that make incredible money, live in the big fancy houses, drive the fancy cars, and you go, oh, they, they're empowered, right? They have it all going on. They're strong. They're empowered. They must have great sex lives on top of it. Those are also my clients. <laughs> For the most part, I have a very, you know, high-scale client base across the board with doctors and attorneys and, and some who's who in the Dallas area. And it's one of those things that I have learned because I would have been underneath that impression too. You know, they've got it figured out. What they're doing is they're masking their disempowerment of their internal life, of their true happiness, of their bliss, by trying to have what, what we're told is success. So they have all these physical things. The, the material world is what they go after because that's what they do and they don't know how to really empower themselves in that fashion. You also find them having, you know, high rates of divorce, cheating, different sexual dysfunctions. Um, you know, I, I have a few clients that are being told right now that they are have sex addictions. And it's, it's very interesting to watch it, how everything unfolds and, and what different therapists are saying and, and what these people are buying into and believing when... It's really just about not being able to, society not accepting sexuality. And when a person accepts their own sexuality and starts to, you know, allow it to blossom, however it is, because there's no norm to sexuality. <laughs> there isn't. What's good for you may not be good for me, and vice versa. And it's both perfect. Our sex lives are perfect for what we want, what we desire. It's if we're getting our desires met and if we're going about it in a healthy fashion and learning about our own boundaries and, and how to you know, truly open up, unfold to that sexual process that causes a liberation, a blossoming of the spirit. Um, Nicole de Leon, who is the founder of One Taste, she wrote a book called Slow Sex. And she did a TED Talk um, a couple of years ago. I don't know if you're familiar with TED Talk. Yes. Okay. TED Talk a, a few years ago. And she ends it by saying the cure for Western America, for Western America is a turn on women. Mm -hmm. Is turn on women in general. And I completely agree with her. But I believe that it's not just women. I believe that it's a turn on society. Yes. And that means that from the very roots, and I'm talking about like when our children start to blossom and start to ask questions, to empower them instead of to disempower them, to actually teach them that sex and sexuality and their bodies changing is all beautiful and part of a, a process that needs to happen and is all perfect and okay, and act in love about it instead of shaming them. Yes. And what we do is we shame our children over their developing bodies, spirits, minds, emotions. And then what happens is we have people running around with, well, if I just get a better car, I'll be happier, and I'll get laid more, and I'll da 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 So don't touch yourself. That's simple. So don't touch yourself. 
right? Still go blind. You'll go blind. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna what, go blind. Okay. That's what we call them. So, and then you're gonna have a sex addiction. What do you tell them instead of that? I really just bring it back to desire and you know the programs. I deal a lot with people's programming. And it's, it comes down to, you know, what have you been told? Why are you buying other people's beliefs and allowing them to control you? Because that's what we do. We come in and we're told, don't do this, but do that. And we never question it. And in our lack of questioning, we then just continue down this process. And before we know it, it becomes our belief. It's something a belief that we purchase, not one that we actually have developed. So it's not our core it's somebody else's, and it's it's just um, <laughs> it's sheep being led off the slaughter in a lot of ways. It really is. I mean, in our sex lives, and, and it comes down to the more you can suppress somebody's sexuality, the more they are feeling caged and that they can't or shouldn't do. It. And it's really shouldn't. It's the should moments that get us more than the can'ts. Because the can'ts, we're all rule breakers. Yeah. We want to go and you know, oh no, I'm going to test out for good. Decided to be caught. But when we feel at our core that we're actually doing something wrong, we all have these moral lines. And wherever that moral line has been drawn for us as a child through our through our programming, through our development, you know, it's from churches, from family, friends, teachers, you name it. And you look at just the sex that the schools put out there, they don't teach about sex, they don't teach about even safe sex. Just some really stupid stuff. <laughs> but what they're doing in there is they're shaming people. And when that shame gets really found, the fact becomes more part of the foundation of the person, that's where the problems come in. And that's where people start to go, well, I shouldn't do that. So and you, you literally can see people slumping and caving in because they should not do something. And just because they have thought possibly doing it, they instantly shame themselves in, in their minds. And it really comes down to what's going on between your own two ears and learning how to change those thoughts and then reconnecting to ourselves. And and it not being a bad thing, but it being a beautiful thing. And bringing that consciousness, which is where, between the two ears, our mentality has to change so that our consciousness can rise about our sexuality. So it can be more heart-centered instead of just, you know, about the genitals getting released. Because that's really a crappy orgasm. <laughs> can you say that again? <laughs> it is, it, yeah, I mean, there is more. There's so much more. There's that's so just the more. tip of the iceberg, no pun intended. It is. I mean, there really is enlightened sex, and there is a, a level where you feel almost, it's like a near-death experience that can happen, and it, it's just this beautiful event where you feel like you're like touching, and in David Dita's terms, he says, you're, you're touching the big toe of God, and I'm like, that's absolutely true. I've had moments like that where I feel just this elevation happening internally during orgasm, and it's has nothing really to do with my genitals. Nope. It is complete spiritual rapture in that moment. So it is safe to say, I think I read it somewhere, that the most important sex organ is the brain, which is basically what you're saying. Organ-wise, yes. 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 <laughs> well, tell me more. What, what, what did you hesitate? Because I would say that the most important part of sex is our spirit. Okay. But our spirit is not the organ. So. Okay, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I would say that the spirit has more to do with it than anything. So the more spiritually connected we are to ourselves, so the more grounded we are in our own in our own spiritual life, in that embodiment of, of God within ourselves, that is actually how we elevate our sex life our, or any part of our life. I mean, sex in general is the core of creation fluid for anything that we want to do. Whether we're writing a great piece of music, we're creating incredible raw juices, we're building a business, we're painting a, a portrait, or we're really focused on, you know, creating this incredible vacation for our family. That is that sexual energy, that driving creation energy that keeps us 
going. And people who say, oh, I'm bored, I'm dissatisfied with life, I'm depressed, I don't know what to do, nothing makes me happy, blah, 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 all these things, it's because they're completely disconnected from their sex, yes. from that sexual creative energy, that muse that lives with us. So, Napoleon Hill, did you read that book? Okay. I'm sure. Thank um, you very much. Thank you very much. Chapter 11. <laughs> <laughs> he really touches on that really heavily. Mm -hmm. How. Um, and like, so this guy, it's not just some dude that is completely unknown, like he did a lot of research with Andrew um, Carnegie. So, you know, financially supported by him and researched a bunch of uh, very, very successful, very not just normally successful, but like extremely successful individuals. Yeah. And he saw that the pattern was a, a, an empowered sex life. Mm -hmm. So what you're telling me then is that we can uh, achieve not just normal life, but an emancipated kind of lifestyle through our sexual experience. Absolutely. And you actually help people do that every day. Yeah, and, and as I was just telling my friend earlier today, I said I'm at a point with so many of my clients that I'm now, you know, four, five, six years in with some people, and I'm now seeing this... It's like a birthing process with them, and it's all of a sudden, it's, it's like a volcano is going off in my client base because, unfortunately, I'm losing people, and it's like, they're now my friends, and, all, and I'm not losing them. I'm losing them in a business way because the people who came to me and were having sex sometimes and were, you know, had horrible jobs or were dissatisfied with their jobs, had too many businesses that they owned and they needed to offset some, you know, had horrible marriages. All of a sudden, stuff, I'm seeing them. Finally, they're coming. They're all coming to this point where I follow most of them on Facebook. Where I'm seeing, oh, so and so is now getting married to this person that they've been dating for a year, and so and so is just, you know, they're they're actually did they did take that promotion, and now they're going to do this. And somebody else completely dropped their corporate life and is living their purpose, living their dream, building whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm seeing that. I probably got a good dozen plus clients right now that are going through this. And on top of it, I also have seen that some people that I know are all kind of merging together and they, I didn't introduce them. <laughs> like, I didn't introduce these people, but they're they're all now running in the same circles. And it's that consciousness. Yeah. They've now elevated into that stream and they're just kind of moving together. It's becoming this beautiful thing. I'm does not know what's going to hit them because some of these people have actually merged into some taboo practices, you know, or really just opening up different branches. That is um, one. I, I try to focus on practical examples. I think that there's a bunch of theory out there, so that's why I was like really, really excited to get to talk to you about this, um, and especially being that it's kind of the genesis of the network, uh, having you as a foundation block towards uh, other things because the very first thing and most important thing is sure survival but the next one will be your how you sex and from there everything sprouts out of it. In so, a completely voluntary and free society there are no prescriptions. There's not a one size fits all. Um, and I think that in our society there are only dysfunctions in sexuality because there are prescriptions of what we should and shouldn't do. So just, you know, marriage is one man and one woman or, you know, and nothing beyond that. So people that have different needs and wants feel trapped, alienated, maybe even they develop some sort of uh, problems. So they come to you and you help them. What kind of, um, just to open up and, you know, like I just learned about polyamory probably like a few months ago, um, relatively new in this. So imagine that I don't know anything. Let's go back in time, three months. Okay. And aside from, um, you know, just, uh, I guess like I was confused with certain ways of, uh, like, that they explain the wording. So, what do you see 
what kind of practices do you see like within people? Like, do you see monogamy? Definitely. That's probably about seventy percent of my clients. Seventy percent. What else do you see? What what you would classify as serial monogamous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what does that mean? I mean, I know what that means. But... Literally, it's it's those people that believe that they should not be in any kind of relationship normally, but definitely an intimate relationship with more than one person at a time. And and you get that whether it's heterosexual or homosexual based, I mean, because there's plenty of that. Although people who are homosexual are a lot more open-minded in general. There is a lot more room where they're more willing to explore polyamory and different things. Um, but there still is that wonderful little thing called jealousy that pops up. And we've been taught that jealousy is a form of love. And that when somebody is jealous because we were flirting with the stranger who checked us out at the store and we were just being nice, but it was a little innocent flirtation now where you know, all of a sudden we're, we're going to cheat on our partner and we're going to run off and you know run into the sunset with the cashier boy. <laughs> 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 because he's younger and better looking and whatever, whatever the reason, it, whatever, and what I think the biggest part of, my biggest issue with monogamy is the, the rule set there of the, you know, it's not even okay, like this in a lot of monogamous relationships would cause a fear point to come in, jealousy to, well, why did you sit that close to him? And why did you smile when he said that? And why did you do, 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 do? And did you hug him? I mean, that would be, that's what I see a lot of. And I see it not, both female and male. That's pretty dysfunctional, no? Oh, yeah, I mean, jealousy is really only a sign of the person who is jealous, their insecurities and issues with themselves. It has nothing to do with the other party. Yep. It's everything on that person. They're, they're dealing with, with their feeling of lack, like they don't bring enough to the table, they don't bring, they're not special enough, there's, you know, well, why would you want to be with me, because you could be, it's just, you know, over and over again, I have teenage daughters, and they've told me that, you know, some of the boys that they've dated, they go, well, I'm just not good enough for you, and you're da 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 and that's their, that's their stuff, that's not yours, don't buy into it, so keep being yourself, living true to yourself, and they're going to figure it out or not, but the best thing you can do is stay empowered and yeah. stay true to yourself. And that's where we're told in monogamy, you know, it's not okay to to really have relationship with the opposite sex, definitely, when we are with somebody. Um, so then we've moved into the whole role of now we've got polyamory or open relationships, swingers, you know, um, that was the one that got posted on Facebook, the relationship anarchist. Oh, the, uh, yeah, thank you, Corey, for that. Uh, <laughs> anarcho, uh, sick, no, something, it's anarcho sexuality. Yeah, oh, anarcho relationship anarchists. Yeah. yeah. So basically, going against the grain of the normal, not labeling the relationship at all. So if you're with somebody, yeah, I'm with you, but I'm not taking any claim to what our relationship is. Um, that's all, I mean, in my, I'm, I'm probably would be classified underneath that, but at the same time, we live in a world that labels everything. Yeah. So even in the statement of saying, I'm a relationship anarchist, aren't I kind of going against being a relationship anarchist? Uh-huh. Because I'm labeling myself. <laughs> yes. Yes. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, well, I am, but I'm not. Eh. It's, if we just, you know, stop worrying about the labels and stop worrying about what everybody else thinks. Get to that point. Get good with yourself. Get good with what your needs are, with what your desires are, and start realizing that like attracts a like, and that, you know, we're pulling everything into our lives. Yes. Whether it's good, bad, does not matter. We're responsible. Exactly. And what I keep seeing over and over again is people coming in and they're like, well, fix me or fix my partner. <laughs> I get that one all the time. Fix my wife. Fix my husband. How do I, how do, how can you help me fix her or whatever the scenario is? And it's like, no, you can't fix them. You're, you are not born to fix another person on this planet. 
it's plain and simple. You are here for you alone. And in working on yourself, a lot happens. Number one, you, you have so much more tolerance. You just, you do. You tolerate things easier because you're dealing with your own crap. You have more unconditional love and acceptance for everybody because you have learned how to love yourself and accept your own human flaws and mistakes. And, you know, anytime we start to label, we are actually, it, it, it's kind of like the war on drugs. The more we put a war on something, the more it erupts, yes. the bigger it gets. So the more we try to fight against labels, the more labels we're going to get presented with. And that's just going to cause frustration and separation. And if you really look at what love means and what unconditional love means and what enlightenment and empowerment means, it's about filling that gap, not causing a bigger gap. So I'm really at a point where what I work with people a lot on is to, you know, how can we bring this closer? And it's really how can you bring yourself closer inside? Yes. Because once you start to have that merger of mind, body, soul internally and in really embody your soul. And, by, and I talk about embodying God because I believe that we're all faces of God. Mm -hmm. So when we learn how to really just accept our power and, and our creative way, whatever that is, then that's, that allows us to accept, accept others. Totally. So it's just like the double bind, just like with everything else, we try to get rid of it, but by that same initiative we bring more of. So exactly. yeah, the secret of life is what we focus on. If you research marriage traditionally, now our traditional man, woman, one and one, married for a lifetime, for better or for worse, right? Two kids, picket fence, yeah, that marriage. If you research that and you take it back to where it began, what you will find out is that number one, marriage truly is a contract. It has nothing to do with love. Um, it was funny, I, my washer and dryer went out in my house and I had to go to a laundromat for the first time in like 15 years. I find myself at the laundromat with, with my kids and we're all, you know, house full of people and I'm doing massive amount of laundry and there's some TV show on of which I don't watch TV very much so I have no idea what this talk show was but it was a bunch of women sitting up there and she the the hostess on there she's going on and on and on about you know marriage is not a contract it's about love it's about this it's about that and she's just going on about how it was basically about cheating was the, the conversation this one woman's husband or whatever had cheated on it and they were damning him and it was I'm listening to it, you know, in the backdrop as I'm folding laundry, and I'm thinking that is how it's, it's this representation that we have been told about, that we have all bought into from, you know, we go to weddings, we go to funerals, we go to, you know, anniversary parties, vow renewal events, all this stuff, and it's all focused on something that was actually created because as man grew and started to flourish, and mankind is what I mean, as humankind started to grow and flourish, we needed a way to transfer property. That's where marriage came from, a transfer of property. Because the men who were working and the land and doing all this stuff and, and kids were helping and women were helping and, and, you know, it was villages coming together and they needed to be able that when the primary house owner who had the land, who, you know, tilled the soil for the most part, passed on, he needed to be able to transfer it to somebody so they continue on. So the people that he was caring for would be provided for for the next generation and the next generation next year. Here we have marriage. Here we have the contract. I'm going to marry you and in this marriage contract that means that if I pass or if before you that you and the offspring will get the property and then it will pass down to the, the eldest and to this and to that. You go back even further than that practice 
and you look at sexuality and liberation and what you have when you really, really go back in time, and I'm talking thousands of years now, what you have with, you know, <laughs> the savage beasts that existed back then that were humans, right? Well, before they went out and they would plant, before they would go and hunt, they would actually have a humongous celebration where they would, you know, party around the fire. And there would be the high priestess, let's call her. She would be the most fertile woman in the clan. She was the sought after. So all of the men who would go out on the hunt the next day, they were actually trying to mate with her. because, And she wanted the best possible man to mate with because offspring needed to be strong. They needed to be able to thrive. And her fertility meant if she got pregnant that night after, and they had this great hunt and everything, and then she got pregnant, it actually meant that the whole village would prosper. You know, their their soil would be strong and fertile, their crops would grow healthy, they wouldn't be attacked upon. It was a very spiritual thing. And they would do it in front of the whole clan by the fire. Talk about swinging, right? Wow. <laughs> yeah, so there's an orgy for you. <laughs> but so, I mean, that's at our core. That's that's there. We, we we damn these things. We say, oh, you shouldn't crave, you know, seeing other people having sex. You shouldn't crave wanting sex with somebody other than the person that you got married to 20 years ago and you haven't had sex with for six years, who won't even, lift a, you know, acknowledge that you walk in the door. That's where a lot of marriages are. They're sexless marriages. So... These cravings, these yearnings, these desires, we see people, oh man, he's attractive, she's attractive, you know, maybe it's the same sex, maybe it's the opposite sex, maybe it's a couple, and we go, hmm, whatever that is, it's not a bad thing, it's more of just acknowledging it and being okay with it, it doesn't mean that you have to go and sleep with anybody, that's the thing, it, it's, it really comes down to that, the more you allow the liberation of your own sexuality happen, the less likely you are to actually go and go and do some really stupid things. It's the people who continuously allow themselves to be suppressed that finally they erupt and they go and do dangerous things. It's they're they're uneducated and they're acting on complete ego. So they're just I'm gonna go do that. I'll show them that attitude. Regardless comes of out. what the other person thinks or wants, you know, I'm That's just right. gonna do it. Yep. So it's not quite voluntary. No. Sometimes. A lot of it is is driven by a need to rebel, like teenagers. That need to rebel. That's but powerful. So yeah. You just taught me a bunch of history. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I actually. Um, I was going to ask you if you have ever listened to any of Nityama's stuff. No, I have not. Okay. I'll send more. you some links to okay. Nityama. He is a very incredible wisdom, spiritual. He's a, I'm going to call him a, a tantric teacher because he's extremely tantric, but he, much like many practitioners, he has merged about eight or nine different practices probably together. And he's now he's got a few students across the world. But listening to him is liberating because he goes to your core and he makes you just go that feeling right in the pit of your stomach where you go oh he's right he's right and he talks about that raw material and it's, it's stuff like that he hits on marriage and on villages on child rearing on our shame level and all this different stuff and I think that a lot of it we ignore that 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 feeling. We go, oh no, I don't want to hear it. I'm going to run away. I'm going to go have, you know, a drink or whatever. Do whatever to, to offset, to mask. But if we all listen to when we get that clinch, what's really happening? What is our body actually trying to tell us in that moment? And I, I really think that, that it's those moments that are saying, no, no, you need pay to attention. you need to pay attention. You're actually blocked here. You're blocked at your core. Right there at the core, your block. I mean, right where that hits is right between the navel and our second chakra is normally where we get that feeling, and that's that sexual energy and our actually driving our core energy coming together, which can do one of two things for us: 
block us up really, really good energetically where we just go, oh, and then we feel sick and we start to have disease in our bodies and all this stuff happens and depression kicks in and, you know, whatever spices we have really go crazy and the ego comes in. Or if you're into releasing it, that's where you start to experience this beautiful energy flow in your body and that's where you get the elevated, you know, feelings and the enlightened orgasmic bliss. It's not just during sex, you can have that at any point. Any of you are interested in, and you're in that, well, you do travel sometimes with your workshops, but um, certainly follow her. There's uh, going to be links at the bottom with her website and her Facebook page that she also has. Um, she writes a blog regularly, and it's really, really interesting stuff. And shoot her an email or just contact her on Facebook for any, any more information you would like to have uh, on her or her work. So this is, uh, again, Kendall Williams, and this is Luis with Emancipated Human. Thank you. Peace, love, and anarchy.